Hello and welcome to In-Depth, our program devoted to current events of national and international importance. I am Aditi Nakpal Girotra. The 47th Chief Justice of India is all set to be sworn in on 18th of November this year. President Ramnath Kovind will administer the oath of office to Justice Sharad Arvind Bobde after naming him the next Chief Justice of India on Tuesday. With a long stint of eight years as Supreme Court judge, Justice Bobre is expected to demit office on 23rd of April 2021. Justice Bobre will succeed present CJI Ranjan Gogoi, who initiated the process of appointment by writing a letter to the center recommending his name. Justice Gogoi will be retiring from his post on November 17th, a day before Justice Bobre takes oath. Today in in depth we will look at the milestones in Justice Bobre's judicial career his powers as a CJI and some of the judgments that he has delivered so far Justice Bobre will be administered the oath of office by President Kovind Several top dignitaries are expected to attend the oath taking ceremony. In his stint as CJI, he will get to preside over a host contentious cases. On 29th October, President Ramnath Kovind formally announced that Justice Sharad Arvind Bobde will be India's next Chief Justice of India. Justice Bobde will take oath on November 18th, 2019. a day after incumbent CJI Ranjan Gogoi demits office Justice Bobde has been chosen in line with the rule of seniority CJI Gogoi recommended his name in a letter to the center Justice Bobde will be India's 47th CJI his tenure as CJI will last 17 months and he is due to retire on 23rd April 2021 Mr Sarad Vinod Bobde is the full name would be going to be our new chief justice of india after chief justice ranjan gogoi retires mr bobde is from a family of uh, lawyers and the judges if i rightly recollect he will be the third generation because his father was also an eminent lawyer of the supreme court his grandfather was also very well known in judicial field so he is not a, a stranger or unknown person so far as the judicial field is concerned he originally comes from nagpur and he practiced for substantial period in the bombay high court both in nagpur bench aurangabad and bombay as well as goa because as you know bombay high court has apart from the main seat in bombay it has at least three more benches and he practiced in all those benches apart from uh, coming regularly or more frequently to appear in the supreme court born on april 24th 1956 in nagpur to a family of lawyers justice bobde completed the bachelor of arts and llb degrees from nagpur university he was enrolled as an advocate of the bar council of maharashtra in 1978 Justice Bobde practiced law at the Nagpur bench of the Bombay High Court with appearances at Mumbai and before the Supreme Court for over 21 years. He was designated senior advocate in 1998. Justice Bobde was appointed judge of the Bombay High Court on 29th March 2000. In 2012 he was sworn in as Chief Justice of Madhya Pradesh High Court. In 2013 he was elevated to the Supreme Court of India. The second senior most judge in the Supreme Court, Justice Bobde is recognized for handling several important matters. He is currently part of a five judge constitution bench that will soon deliver its judgment in the Ayodhya land dispute case. The constitution bench which also includes Justice Gogoi is expected to deliver the keenly awaited Ayodhya verdict. by 15th november justice bobde was also part of the three judge bench which in 2015 clarified that no citizen of india without an aadhar card can be denied basic services and government services 
In 2016, he also led the three-judge bench that first suspended the sale of firecrackers in the national capital region. In 2017, Justice Bobde upheld the Karnataka government's ban on a book on grounds that it outraged the religious feelings of Lord Basavanna's followers. Looking forward to the Ayodhya case, I mean that is the first and the uh, foremost. There are other cases, the Sabarmalai matter, for example. I mean there are number of matters which are to be decided. These are matters which will decide the fate of India as it is in future. Justice Bobde will also get a host of contentious issues like the NRC, BCCI, and Sahara cases as a worrisome legacy from his predecessors. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. The significance of the cases also underlines the primacy of the post of Chief Justice in the judicial system. Under the Indian Constitution, the post of the Chief Justice is supreme. This can be understood by the fact that the Chief Justice of India discharges the role of the President if the office of President and Vice President suddenly becomes vacant in emergency situations. Apart from this, if there is a confusion about constitutional provisions, the only valid interpretation then is the one given by the Supreme Court. Let's take a look at the qualifications mentioned in the constitution for such an important post. The Indian constitution gives the power of appointing judges to the president. The president can take advice on these appointments from the union cabinet. For the appointment of the Chief Justice of India, the President can take advice from the judges of the Supreme Court and High Courts and other people as he deems fit. In 1993, a nine-judge Supreme Court bench ruled that a judge's seniority must be considered for appointment of the CJI and that the Chief Justice of India must be consulted for the appointment of other judges of the Supreme Court. Appointment of the Chief Justice of India is basically by seniority or hierarchy. Uh, this is what the process is. It has only been broken, I think, twice in the history of the uh, of Indian as an independent country. But the next in line is usually uh, uh, put up as the next Chief Justice of India. The constitution, however, does not specify any directives for the appointment of the Chief Justice of India. The eligibility criteria for the CJI is same as that of any Supreme Court judge. Article 124.3 of the Constitution prescribes that for appointment as a judge of the Supreme Court, a person must be a citizen of India, the person must have served as a judge of any high court for at least five years, or been an advocate in a high court for ten years, or is, in the opinion of the President, a distinguished jurist. There is no minimum age for appointment as a Supreme Court judge. A judge of the Supreme Court, once appointed, holds office until he completes the age of 65. Article 124.4 prescribes the conditions in which the post of CJI may fall vacant. These are retirement on completion of 65 years of age, resignation and removal through proper procedures. The grounds for removal of the CJI are proven misbehaviour and incapacity. The constitution has also underlined measures to protect the independence of Supreme Court judges including the CJI. That is why the process of removal of the Chief Justice is a complex one. The wages, allowances, leave and pension of the judges is determined by the parliament and cannot be altered unless there is a financial emergency. The additional expenditure or perks of the judges is borne by the state, but the CJI and judges are not allowed to continue practice in the courts after retirement. Being the head of the Judiciary of India and Supreme Court, the CJI heads their administrative functions and has several special powers. As head of the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice is responsible for allocating cases and appointment of constitutional benches that deal with important matters, due to which he is often referred as the master of roster. The Chief Justice also allocates all work to the other judges who are bound to refer the matter back to him or her in any case where they require it to be looked into by a larger bench of more judges. The Chief Justice's special powers are on not just on the judicial side, but on the side of the power that he imposes by the constitution. So when the president has to be sworn in or the governor has to be sworn in, the, the powers of the chief justice come as he is the one who swears in. There are other 
uh, officers by the constitution whose swearing in is done by the chief justice of india on the administrative side the chief justice maintains the roster and has the power to appoint court officials the chief justice also has the power to assist the president in appointing supreme court and high court judges the cji also holds the advisory powers in which he or she can instruct and advise the government to work about certain issues bureau report rajya sabha tv with this we'll halt in for a quick break but we'll be back soon stay tuned with us Welcome back you're still with us on in depth the right to appoint judges of the high court and the supreme court lies with the committee of judges called the collegium the chief justice of the supreme court is the head of the committee and four other senior most supreme court judges are its members this collegium has been in force of our country for over two decades Under the constitution the president has the right to appoint judges in the supreme court and high courts but the constitution does not have a separate provision for the appointment of the chief justice of india from 1951 to 1973 the supreme court's senior most judge has always been appointed as the chief justice of india according to the constitution the president under the advice of ministers can also consult judges of the supreme court and the high courts let's go back in history to understand the appointment of judges better in 1973 when justice a n ray was appointed chief justice of india his appointment superseded three other senior judges of the supreme court jay shankar manilal shelat a n grover and k s hegde this triggered widespread protests by bar associations and legal groups across india it was believed that the other senior judges were not considered for appointment as their judgment in the keshavananda case was not in favor of the government not only this instance in 1977 justice h r khanna was replaced by justice m u beg as the chief justice of india in protest justice khanna also tendered his resignation Uh, Legislators and judges who criticized the government's move felt that the judiciary's discretionary powers were reduced. This led to the establishment of the Supreme Court's collegium system that appoints judges to the nation's constitutional courts. The genesis of the collegium system is in three of Supreme Court judgments that are collectively known as the three judges cases. The first judges case is the SP Gupta case in 1981. In this case, Supreme Court's consultation was taken only as consideration in the appointment of judges. In 1993, a bench of 9 Supreme Court judges led by Justice J S Verma reversed this arrangement and considered complying with the Supreme Court's advice to be binding. The court said the collegium will do the transfer and appointment of judges. This decision came to be known as the second judges case. The introduction of the collegium system actually started with this case. In 1998, then President K R Narayanan sought the opinion of the Supreme Court on the meaning of the word consultation under Article 124, 217 and 222 of the Constitution. A few days later, a nine-member bench of the Supreme Court headed by Justice S P Bharuj ordered on October 28, 1998 that in the matter of appointment the governor is above the legislature the supreme court's verdict in 1993 was thereby right to say that the consultation was binding this order of 1998 is known as the third judges case so the collegium system is a very interesting system this has been created by the honorable judges themselves and there were three judges three different cases which are called the three judges cases so this was after the first one was after the emergency so now what was done was that the judges decided that the politics can never come in play and control judiciary and therefore judiciary has to be independent so the judges decided a system which would be independent of polit- politics for judicial independence the second judges the second judges case created the collegium system the collegium system basically was that the five top most judges which includes the chief justice of india are going to decide the fate of the other judges to for appointment of judges the third decided so the the law as far as before that was that you that the the judiciary will recommend the name of the judge that they want to appoint to the president of india 
in the third and the second and the third it was clarified in the third in the second case it was decided a recommendation does not mean that the that the president can reject so the recommendation was more in the nature of a direction the president could send it back if he had certain observations or clarifications or doubt but if it was sent back by the collegium it had to be accepted So the Under the collegium system a committee of senior judges headed by the chief justice of India decides on the appointment of judges the collegium comprises the chief justice of India and four senior most judges of the supreme court other than appointment of judges of the supreme court and high courts the collegium also decides on the transfers of judges the collegium also takes decisions on promoting high court judges to the supreme court Besides this the Supreme Court has also laid down nine guidelines for the functioning of the collegium system. The Supreme Court came out with some guidelines and clarifications to improve the collegium system of appointment of judges in the higher judiciary to make it more transparent and accountable. These include the term consultation with the Chief Justice of India in articles 124-2, 217-1 and 222-1. requires consultation with the plurality of judges in the formation of the opinion of the CJI the sole individual opinion of the CJI does not constitute consultation the CJI can only make a recommendation to appoint a judge of the supreme court and to transfer a chief justice or other judge of a high court in consultation with the four senior most judges of the supreme court As far as the high courts are concerned the recommendation must be made in consultation with the two senior most judges of the supreme court strong cogent reasons do not have to be recorded as justification for a departure from the order of seniority in respect of each senior judge who has been passed over what has to be recorded is the positive reason for the recommendation The views of the judges consulted should be in writing and should be conveyed to the government of India by the CJI along with his views to the extent set out in the body of this opinion. The CJI is obliged to comply with the norms and the requirement of the consultation process in making his recommendations. Recommendations by the CJI without such compliance are not binding upon the government. The transfer of high court judges is judicially reviewable only if the CJI took the decision without consulting the other four judges in the Supreme Court collegium or if the views of the chief justices of both high courts involved in the transfer are not obtained. The CJI is not entitled to act solely in his individual capacity without consultation with other judges of the Supreme Court. in respect of materials and information conveyed by the government for non appointment of a judge recommended for appointment the cji can consult any of his colleagues on the appointment of a high court judge to the supreme court or transfer of a judge the consultation need not be limited to colleagues who have occupied the office of a judge or chief justice of that particular high court bureau report rajya sabha tv The constitution has given an arrangement under which the judiciary system for union and states is not separate it is uniform for the entire country the supreme court is the highest and final court for appeals in this entire system under which there are high courts of states and under them are other subordinate courts this is how all the courts of india are linked with the supreme court being the highest among them The Supreme Court comprises the Chief Justice and 30 other judges appointed appointed by the President of India. The Supreme Court of India is the guardian of the constitution. It is laid down in chapter 4 under part 5 of the constitution. Articles 124 to 147 state the constitution and the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in detail. Articles 124 to 147 in part 5 of the constitution deal with the organization, independence, jurisdiction, powers and its procedures. The Supreme Court is the highest judicial forum and the final court of appeal under the Constitution of India. Article 124 provides the provision for the judiciary in India. Initially, the constitution provided for a Supreme Court with a chief justice and 7 judges. At the same time it gave powers to parliament to increase the number of judges from time to time which is why parliament enacted the supreme court number of judges act 1956 to increase the strength of the supreme court 
In the same year, the number of judges was increased from 7 to 10. As the work of the court increased, the parliament increased the number of judges to 13 in 1960, 17 in 1977, 26 in 1986 and 31 in 2008, which is its current strength. The Supreme Court was established on the 26th of January 1950, while it came into being in its present form on 28th January 1950. Its inaugural session was held at the Chamber of Princes in Parliament House Complex. It was here that the Supreme Court sat for 12 years between 1937 and 1950. In 1958, the Supreme Court moved to its present premises. Every Supreme Court judge is appointed by the President of India. The Constitution provides a unified judicial system, keeping the Supreme Court at its apex. Therefore, the Supreme Court exercises enormous powers and functions. India's Supreme Court has more power in comparison to the Supreme Court of any other country, given its nature and extent. It has extensive powers in the form of original, appellate and advisory jurisdictions. The Supreme Court controls the entire judicial system in India and occupies a very significant place as the guardian of the constitution and custodian of the fundamental rights of the citizens. The responsibility of interpreting the constitution rests with the Supreme Court of India. The question of law decided by the Supreme Court is binding on all other courts within the territory of India. Article 129 of the Indian constitution deals with contempt of court. Article 131 provides that the Supreme Court shall, to the exclusion of any other court, have original jurisdiction in any dispute. It has the power to settle disputes between the government and the states or between states. As the final court of appeal of the country, it takes up appeals primarily against verdicts of the high courts of various states of the union and other courts and tribunals. Article 137 has empowered the Supreme Court to review its own orders or judgments given earlier. The Supreme Court also enjoys the power to withdraw cases pending before a high court or more than one high court for disposal by itself. The jurisdiction of Supreme Court are, of, are divided in three or four parts. First is the original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means, as you know, if there is a dispute between the central government and the state government of India or between the two or more state governments or a union territory and the state government, original jurisdiction, as you understand, that no other tribunal or the court has the jurisdiction to decide these issues. Advisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which is also one of its kind in, in the world. Uh, for instance, when Parliament or the President of India has some doubt about some controversy about the uh, question which arises from the Constitution of India, it always seeks the advice before the Parliament takes a decision on uh, on any very complicated question of law. Apart from this, the Supreme Court's advisory jurisdiction has been discussed in Article 143 of the Constitution. Under this, the President may approach the Supreme Court for advice on questions of law or fact of public importance which may have arisen or are likely to arise. The Supreme Court may, after due inquiry, report to the President its opinion on such matters. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. So that's it from us today in In-Depth. We'll be back same time tomorrow with a focus on some other subject. In case you missed the television broadcast, you can also watch our program online on YouTube, the link for which is given below. Suggestions and feedback about the program are also welcome. Thank you for your time.